In this segment, we're going to talk about fire scene communication. Now, fire scene communication is probably one of the most critical skills you need to acquire because as we talk and try to relay information back and forth on the scene, it's, it's critical that people not only hear what you're saying, but they also understand it. So we want to talk about some few, a few issues in relation to it. The first thing we want to accomplish, our first objective, is going to be define communication. Before we begin talking about it, we, got, we have to come up with a common definition, one that we all understand and can work from. We also want to explain the key elements of communication. And so we want to talk about what are the parts, what are the pieces of it. And then we discuss some best practices. And then finally, we're going to talk about how to effectively ensure that information is disseminated. These are very critical skills on the scene because time and time again, there are always issues that come up as a result of not being able to effectively communicate with each other. So this is where we want to start off. Now the question comes up, why is this important? Why is this critical that we understand what, what goes on on the scene and why the communication is so critical? Many after action reports often say that communication was a breakdown. That there were issues there getting information back and forth either to crews, either to the incident commander or to other parts of the operation. So it's very important that we understand not only why communication is important, but also understand how to do, deliver it effectively. Before we begin, we, we definitely want to talk about what is communication. What exactly does that mean when we talk about that? And w there are several points I want to bring home with this and make sure we, we understand. First is, inf it is a, an exchange of information. And so communication is, uh, is definitely an exchange of words, visuals, whatever the case may be, but it, you have to make sure that you have this critical point. It has to be a two-way communication. That means you have a sender, a receiver, and there's confirmation that the information is being properly disseminated. So we also, so we want to make sure we understand this. It's at least two people involved. And that, again, you have that constant confirmation back and forth, going back and forth of what is correct and what is being correctly said. Now, an easy way to remember this is to take a look at this chart. We first make sure we have a sender. We also have a receiver. The information has to be transmitted to the receiver, and the person begins to understand that. And how, how we confirm this is when they, they, they can receive back to us or send back to us that information. So th this is a very critical point because on the fire ground particularly, you have a number of things going on, as I said previously, a number of moving parts. So <clears throat> making sure that what you're saying is being heard is very important. One example of communication that's very, that we would work with is first, let's play, replace these terms with specific items. So for example, we have a sender. In, this, in our example, we'll use the dispatcher. The dispatcher transmits out the call. In this case, it may be a structure fire, they give the address, and any other information they may have available. The receiver will be the fire department. And the engine one, for example, may be the one that's going out first. And so they get, take, receive the message, and then they confirm back to dispatch the, the call itself. So this is a, a good example of why the communication taking place in a complete cycle. Another example would be, say for example, if you're a public information officer and you've got information to release to the general public or to the media. In this situation, the public information officer will be the sender. They're going to transmit the information to the media or to the general public. And then we're going to look to see that they've received that information back, either through how they respond to the message, by how they, uh, questions they may ask. And in that situation, we see the reverse. Now we have the media, when they're asking the question, the media may become the sender. So the information is going back and forth between the two. And each time what we're trying to do is confirm that the, what, we, what we're saying is exactly what was received. Because in many cases, and you see this particularly when people say they've been interviewed by a reporter or by someone, that uh, the information wasn't sent out correctly. And, and in those situations, what you may find is that while the sender knew what they were talking about, the receiver didn't quite understand what they were trying to say, or they may have perceived it different. I think of the uh, game my kids like to play, and it's uh, t telling a secret. And they sit in a circle, and one person will whisper into another person's ear, and then that person whispers into another ear, the secret into another ear, and it goes all the way around the circle to the first person. 
And, all, and so many cases, what you find is by the time it gets to back to that first person, the message is completely changed or is something completely different. And that's, that's what we run into in a similar ways on the fire ground. What we think the person's hearing or we think that they are saying uh, may be totally mis misunderstood. And so these are things we want to make sure we address. Likewise, well, some of the mistakes that happen on the fire ground with communication may be situations where let's say the incident commander tells the crew inside the building to go to the other side and do a search and rescue. And the crew in the building because of noise, because of other things going on, they may not have heard it properly and they go to the other side of the building and do a fire attack or even maybe even exit the building. Here's the, and this is a situation where the message was transmitted properly, the receiver may or may not have received it properly and they did something completely different. And that's why this, this confirmation of being received is very important because if you repeat back what you heard, then you know right away whether it was the, the intended message or not. Now let's talk a little more detail about what these key elements that we have to look for and that we want to make sure are in a message. Because there again, understanding that it sounds critical and it sounds like I know, it sounds like I'm coming back to this so often and pounding this particular part of it. But it is very important, particularly when you're on the fire scene, or any incident for that matter, that you have an effective communication going on. Again, if, if it doesn't happen, or information gets missent, or if things are not received properly, then you, you potentially run into, again, somebody getting hurt, someone getting killed, um, make, creating more damage in the structure or the building, any things like that happen. And oftentimes, when you hear about stuff like that happening, almost consistently there's always an issue with communication and so you always want to make sure that this is if in many cases this is always done properly so let's talk about the sender first this is the person who's got to relay information now this can be the incident commander trying to relay orders to the teams on the scene or relay orders to the operations officer um, it could be the dispatcher trying to get information to the incident commander or to the crews responding to the scene all, all of these are people that are trying to relay a message to you. It could also be the public information officer trying to relay information to the general public or to the uh, media. These are all people who are attempting or trying to send a message. Now, we, then we've got from there is transmitted. How can that take place? Um, first, it can happen on the radio. Radio is the most common one that we use if we're dealing with a fire scene situation. Um, it could relay word of mouth. So, for example, you may have somebody uh, who's standing by the incident commander and he or she says, go tell this person the following orders. The, the, the tr way it's transmitted can happen in a number, a number of ways, and there are a variety of them. Um, it may be a letter in a non-emergency situation. It may be an email. Uh, you think of the ways when a disaster is getting ready to move into an area, how we notify the general public that it's time to take shelter. And in, in some areas, what you, what you have are the tornado sirens that go off. You may have where the uh, emergency broadcasting takes over the cable channels and starts posting the message and doing the announcements. Uh, maybe through your radio, you hear that there are, you know, you hear about the uh, updates and so forth. So how the message is transmitted is uh, often, oftentimes just as important as the message because it's going to determine whether they understand what you're saying and whether they comprehend what you're saying. And so an example, another example would be a situation where you may have uh, to the general public, you're trying to tell them to take sh uh, shelter or you're trying to talk with the media. And uh, you want to make sure they understand through this face-to-face -face discussion that what, what you're trying to relate to them. So that's oftentimes where you'll take questions. That's, uh, you may try to solicit feedback to them to make sure they understand what you're saying. And you also want to make sure that what, you're that what you're telling them, they can then relate to somebody else. Again, like, uh, referencing back to that game that the, the little kids play of telling, telling a secret, it's a situation where you're telling the media, they're relaying it to the general public, and who may relate it to somebody else who's interested in what's going on. So you've got three, potentially three, four levels that information is being relayed, and if it's not done properly, uh, it gets, becomes mixed up, it becomes confusing, and oftentimes your message may even be dropped. So the, how it's transmitted is very important. Another part is you need to have a receiver. The receiver has to be, one, they have to be open to the information. 
Now in our, our field, that's just a little more, that's a little easier to do because there's a crisis going on. There's an emergency of sorts. So their reception to the information will be a lot better uh, than in a typical non-emergency situation. And a non-emergency situation, I would say, is uh, I'll give an example of a guy that comes into the station, says his, you know, they've got a newborn that's trying to sleep at night, and the siren's going out late at night, wake up the baby, and he wants to talk to somebody about it. Now, you, you, can, you can typically transmit to them the information that, you know, this is a state law, this is a requirement, this is uh, something of that nature, but that you have to go with the lights and siren to the call. You can't just do one or the other or neither. Um, so you're transmitting that information to him, but my guess is this guy does not want to hear that. <laughs> he does not want to hear that you can't, that you have, that you, you can't turn off the lights and siren. So how he's going to perceive it, and this is very important because perception is very, very important in how people receive information. With perception, that tells you that, that you can say the words, but they're going to, they're going to, they may translate it a little bit differently. And so, you, depending on what, what, what's going on with them at the time. So when you, you ask, you solicit to find out if they understood what you said, you may find that the response is not what you were, what you were intending. So perception plays a big role in how the person will receive the information. Now one of the things as well along with this is you want to make sure that they understand what you said. On well, radio communication is very simple. We, when the dispatcher tells us something, we simply uh, repeat it back to, to them. And they know that what we received was correct. On the fire scene, it's very important that when you, you give an order or you give a command, that the receiver in turn repeats that back to you so that you, you're sure they understand what you're talking about. And, and again, this is where a breakdown typically occurs. When the receiver doesn't tell them or repeat back what was said, there's a, there's a possibility they may not have understood. And so you kind of leave that, that, that loop here kind of open. And you don't know until they actually begin doing the task if they properly understand what's being told to them. And in these situations, not understanding what they're being told could put them in danger, could put somebody else in danger, or possibly could uh, create greater damage to the home or to the uh, structure. So we want to make sure that what's being, re what's, what's being received is exactly what we intended. And this is where we get this, con that's why we look for this confirmation. Now, in a non-emergency situation, we don't necessarily have that luxury. The loop is a little bit harder to keep closed. So what happens is we have to do, the way we have to ensure there's understanding is to solicit questions. So, for example, if I'm teaching a class somewhere and I've just shared some information, uh, maybe I'm teaching a class on how to, how to put on an air pack. And so what I'm going to do is, when I'm done, is I'm going to solicit questions to them. And typically the best way to do this is through open-ended questions. And what I mean by open-ended questions, uh, the easiest way to explain it is just like uh, what is a closed-end. A closed-end question is something they either the, the responder, ha the receiver, has to answer with a yes or no, true or false. In an open-ended question, they have to give you some type of more detailed response. And in the non-emergency situations, you want to make sure that you do that, that you ask open-ended questions to ensure that they understand what you're talking about. And by doing that, you can begin to get a better understanding or help correct any information that wasn't properly understood. So two ways that we've talked about uh, that we can ensure that this loop stays closed. Uh, first is by repeating information, have, having, sending the message, having the receiver repeat it back to you. The second way is sending the message and then asking open-ended questions to ensure the receiver understood. And again, you, you can use, these can be used interchangeably, but you also have to weigh it out based on the situation. There are certain situations that's very critical, time sensitive, that we've got to make sure it happens, in which case we're going to drop to the just repeat it back to me. 
in situations where we may have a little more time or we're dealing with much more detailed information, we may go with opening the questions. The key you don't want to do, put, don't want to do when sending a message is you don't want to just leave, leave closed in did, questions like, did you understand or do you understand? Because all you're going to get there is a yes or no answer. And getting just that yes or no doesn't really clarify for you if they completely understand what you're talking about. Let's briefly talk about here some of the concerns when this does not, this loop doesn't occur. What can happen on the fire ground? Now, there are several instances where this can happen. The first one is the receiver dis didn't receive the information or didn't receive it properly. And what way you determine this is that you get, you get no response. And see, this is one of the issues that makes it very critical to under, for them to, the receiving person to respond back because several things can occur if you don't, if they don't respond back. One, they may not have heard your message. And if you think about what goes on on the fire ground and how the radio communications take place, it's a, it's a very good chance that your information may not have been heard. And so by getting that confirmation back, then you know they, they've not only heard the information, but they understood it. Getting nothing back, they very well may not have heard your message. <clears throat> the other situation is that if they don't respond back, you don't know if they heard it correctly or understood what you were wanting to occur as the incident commander. So while you may have told them to go to one room, one floor, if they did, don't respond back, they very likely could go to another floor not understanding what you're talking about. Another concern that occurs when the receiver doesn't re reply back that they've received the information is they could be in danger. This is one of the best ways to tell if the firefighters are in danger or if there's a situation that may require a mayday. But when you don't get that response back, and if it's consistently a policy that anytime you receive a message that you have to respond back to it and you don't get that then you know something could possibly be wrong and you want to follow up and find out where the crew is and what's going on. So <clears throat> keeping this cl loop closed and always keeping the information flowing to the receiver back to the sender it not only makes sure that information is understood um, but it also gives you a way of tracking your crews and making sure they're safe within the building and that nothing, uh, nothing is going on or there's an emergency that needs to be addressed. The second issue is, is when you get a closed-ended response. Remember, one of the things I talked about was you don't want to ask people what, uh, a question that will um, require a yes or no answer. And because when you do that, there again, you may be sending one thing. The only response you're getting back, though, is a yes or no. Did you understand yes or no? Now, if you think about it, do you understand is a pretty vague question. And so saying, do I understand this, uh, yeah, I, in my mind I may receive it, well, may, may have understood it because of the way I perceived your question or your, your order, but you may have intended something completely different. And in which case, you, what, what happens is there's opportunity there for mix-ups, there's opportunity there for things to go wrong, and eventually possibly even situations where somebody could get hurt if they didn't properly understand what you're asking them to do. So we, again, another example why we need to keep this loop closed and always make sure there's a good, a good relay of information. The, set, the third one is a rushed response. Somebody just rapidly hears what you're, you're trying to uh, tell them to do and then they take off and go. And this is actually very common on the fire ground. You may have someone who keys up the radio, they got the order, thanks and off they go because they're in a hurry, they're trying to get the fire knocked down, they're trying to get things uh, back in order, they're trying to get things, you know, get, bring stabilization to the scene and so they just kind of rush response that yeah we got it. Well and that sounds great, you know they've, you know they've received it, did they understand it, you have, you, you have no idea without actually following that up with can you tell me what I said, can you repeat back to me, confirm what, conf can you confirm my message. All of these are ways that you want to make sure that, and particularly on the fire ground, this is where it's very critical, is that once they receive that information, did they understand it? Did they comprehend what you're telling them? And you may find in some situations that just simply repeating it again, you may have to try to think of a different way to word it, a different way to phrase things so that they understand what you're trying to get them to do. So all of these are concerns that do occur, have occurred on the fire ground that do occur still. And in most, most cases, what you will find is it is a result of a breakdown in communication. 
And oftentimes, you, you hear about accidents that occur on the fire scene. Somebody got injured, somebody got hurt, something like that. In, in a number of cases, uh, many of them, what you will find is at some point in the process, some point in the response, the communication broke down. Now, that could be a breakdown where they didn't understand what was said. Uh, it could be a breakdown where there was no communication, so the crew, the firefighter, or whatever the case may be, may have gone into a freelancing mode because they're not getting any information. Or there are situations where it was, it was completely misunderstood and completely, uh, they, they ended up going completely off of what the plan was intended. So we want to make sure we keep clear communications on the fire ground. We want to make sure that there's always that open line of communication and that this loop here remains closed all the time. That we're constantly sent, for whatever we send out, there's always a confirmation that of what they received and that they understood. Now, with a basic understanding here of what is a transmission, what, are, what is a message, and how does it work, the, pro the messaging process work, we now want to talk about some guidelines, some practices for when you're actually talking on the radio, uh, when you're trying to communicate on the fire ground, and so forth. So let's begin first. Uh, what is the first thing I want to do before I send a message? One, I want to make sure there's a clear airway to talk on. So the, and this is a mistake a lot of folks make. They get so excited, they get on the scene, they, they want, they've got a message to relay back, and they'll key up the mic and start talking. Now, one of the problems with that particularly, and this, does ha this is a very common problem, is that when that other people are on the scene, they're also trying to communicate there's uh, traffic coming from dispatch to the incident commander. Information is going, flowing around, and what you'll find will happen is when you key up the mic to talk, you walk all over everybody else that's already on the radio. Um, the same situation could occur that somebody could do that to you. So the very first thing we want to do before we try to relay information over the radio is we want to make sure that we have a clear channel. Now, if you've got a lot of information or you're going to have some ongoing information, a good tip to do is to make sure that contact dispatch or contact the incident commander and ask if you can get a separate channel, if that's available. This is one way to kind of take, to remove some of the noise and background that's going on from all the other folks trying to communicate. Uh, another good thing to do is that if, if you've got a fairly large operation going, is try to streamline some of the communication by putting them on separate channels. And this way, you don't have to worry about everybody walking all over each other or people uh, missing information because of so much traffic going on on the radio. One of the big things you, where you'll see this occur, important situations where you'll see this occur, is during a mayday operation. And in the mayday operation, you want to make sure that the crew trying to do the rescue uh, has a very clear line of communication to the incident commander and to each other. You don't want them having to try to deal with all the, the noise and background stuff going on, on the, with the fire scene. So you try, you tr try to move them over to a separate channel. And so that's, that's one tip. The other thing is, don't just blurt out what you're going to say. Take a second, take a few seconds or a few minutes and collect your thoughts. What are you trying to broadcast to the other people? be it to the dispatcher, to it be the crew in the building, be it to whoever on the scene. Take a minute and try to collect your thoughts and what do you want to say. Uh, along that lines uh, with that is keep your transmission to brief, concise statements. Now if you think about how much you remember when a person's talking, if you think about the, think back to the last person you heard besides me <laughs> that you were uh, listening to, you, if you think about how you remember what they said, it's typically in fragments. And that's how most people remember things, in, in fragments. Now, the, the issue though is, is when we're transmitting information on the fire scene, we've got to make sure that they remember and that they understand what was being told. We, 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 we talked about that. So when you're transmitting your message, make sure it's a brief, clear, concise statement that can be understood. Uh, I see this one, one situation where you see this is commonly broken is when people are doing the initial scene size up. And when you do initial scene size up, you have to call back. Engine one's on scene, we have a single story residential structure, nothing showing, engine one will be command. The, the issue with that is what I typically see is when people are giving that description, 
You'll see situations like engine one on scene. We have a single story residential structure. We have nothing showing. It has four walls. It's purple, black roof, stone masonry, long driveway. You, you, you get the idea. It becomes a very, very long message. And what you will see happen is after about the first phrase or two, anybody listening to that broadcast basically just kind of tunes out, be it mentally or uh, whatever. Here's a, here's a thing to kind of keep in the back of your mind. The average person takes a mind journey about every eight seconds. So if you've been listening to this, this segment for about a minute, more than likely every eight seconds you've been taking a, a mind journey somewhere else. You're thinking about getting your car washed, you're thinking about you got to go pay the bills, uh, maybe stop and get groceries, or whatever the case may be uh, during this time. And so every eight seconds. So when you're doing your broadcast or you're communicating something over the radio, you've got approximately eight seconds to get everything out before their mind goes somewhere else. And so you want to keep it clear, keep it concise, and keep it simple. Keep it very simple. Don't get too tied up in the different uh, components of it. The, the next thing you want to do is you want to wait for confirmation from the other party. So, so the way this is going to take place is if I, if I were the incident commander and I'm trying to send information to the team in the building, I'm going to send a short message, I'm going to wait for them to confirm, then I'll send another part of the message, wait for them to confirm, and when I say confirm, I'm, look, I'm listening to hear that they repeat back to me what I said. And so if you get into long, detailed discussions, the likelihood of them remembering it's going to, all of it is going to be very slim. So what I, I may say is I, I need you to go in, uh, instant command to interior team. I need you to go to the C side of the building. And what I, I may throw something in there as well to let them know there's more information coming. So I may say break. So engine one, I mean, uh, Interior, interior team, go to the uh, C side of the building, break. Then I'm going to wait for them to respond back and say, interior team uh, to instant command, confirm, go to the C side of the building with break. I need you to do a uh, uh, search, search in the front room or the room on the C side of the building and confirm there are no more victims. They'll respond back. Go to the, do a search and rescue in the room at the seaside side of the building, confirm there are no victims. Now by doing that, what, we, what I've done is I've now been able to send them multiple pieces of information. I've still kept it in fragments so that it's easier for them to retain. And then I've, I, in, each, in each situation, each part of it, I've waited for them to confirm back and that they understand what, I, what I'm asking them to do. And if you take this step, it, it, sound, it may sound very elementary. And you're thinking, oh, we're all adults. We don't need to talk to each other like that. Consider the circumstances that you're talking to people under. This is not two, two folks sitting around at the bar or at the kitchen table or at the uh, uh, coffee shop having conversation. This is a, a high tense very uh, very rough situation that you're dealing with. This is a situation where there's multiple things going on, everything's in rapid mode, and the ability for them to comprehend information is going to be harder. Couple that with the fact that they're, they're wearing gear, they're in an air pack, and the communication's a little bit harder. They've got a flash hood on to cover their ears, things like that. And so even though to you it sounds like you're talking normally, and it may sound clear if you just listen to it on the microphone, when you add those other disturbances, such as bells going off, having an air mask on, those type things, then it becomes a lot harder to understand. And it becomes much more complex for them to try to figure out what you're saying. And so you want to get that confirmation back. Now, what happens if, I don't, if, if what they send back is incorrect? Then you're going to want to immediately notify them that that's the case. So, you may come back and say, uh, that's incorrect, please. and then, then you come back and tell them what the correct information is. So if they, say, they confirm go to the B side of the building, I'm going to come back, that's incorrect, please go to the C, CAT side of the building. 
maybe what they, you know, and it could be any reasons, any number of reasons why they didn't understand. It was too noisy, they couldn't hear well. Maybe they thought instead of C, they heard the letter B. And so there are a number of reasons of why things can break down, but you certainly want to make sure, and that's something I would also recommend with this, is that if you're using letters, C side of the building, B side of the building, uh, D side, if you listen how those sound, the sounds are very close. So if you're using letters, try to associate a word with it that'll help make, make, make it a little bit clearer. So for example, if I say B side of the building, I'm gonna say B boy, C cat, D dog. Those are things that help them understand better what letter I'm using. Because in many cases, again, considering as well how muffled everything sounds from wearing the air pack and wearing the things like that, you, you're gonna find that they're gonna be misunderstanding what you're saying in many cases, or in some cases. So we always want to get that confirmation back of what they heard. And if it's incorrect, we want to go ahead, immediately notify them that it's incorrect, and provide them the correct information. One of the questions that typically comes up is, how do I begin practicing and how do I improve my speaking skills on the radio and on the fire scene? And this is actually a really good question. And unfortunately, not many really take advantage of this, but there are a number of opportunities where you can improve how you present and how you speak on the fire ground. And I, I say this is important because if you think about it, if you're an instructor teaching a class, if you're leading a meeting, you're going to want to make sure that you have some basic level presentation skills. The same thing applies on the fire scene when talking on the radio and when trying to relay commands, that you want that same level of proficiency to be able to do your job effectively. And I, I, I would compare it to any other tool you would use on the fire ground. Communication is a tool, just like your air pack, just like a halligan bar, just like your hose line. All of those are things that you would not send someone into a building that didn't know how to use them. And in the same context, when speaking, it's a tool that we use to communicate information back and forth. We wouldn't want it to send out wrong information or intentionally give people bad information. But in a sense, when we're not practicing this particular skill and we're not keeping this skill up, then we could just as likely do that and send them into a, a bad situation. So we want to make sure these skills are definitely kept up to speed, that we're doing these well and doing things properly. Uh, the, the first way you can do this, and I would suggest, is that begin listening to the uh, radio when other departments are going out, uh, when you're on other calls that you're not going to within your department. Listen to how they communicate. What goes well, what doesn't go so well and weigh those out in relation to the communication and that's going on and see if, if there are things that they're doing that work really well that you could in, integrate into the way you speak on the radio. Um, maybe there's some things they didn't do so well. And in those situations, you may want to learn from that to not use those skills, that particular skill. So listening to the radio um, and listening to the calls that are going on is a great way to learn how to improve how you communicate. Another way is uh, many departments, many of the dispatch centers now record what's going on at least on the primary channel. So uh, something you can do as a training session, as an after action type thing is get a copy of that recording. Use it in, the, in your department with the crews that responded on ways they can improve how they're communicating. Again, we've, we've said communication is typically the weakest link on the scene and often is the one that leads to a breakdown or problem. So we want to take advantage of that. If we can listen to the recordings that went on, if we can listen to the communications that are going back and forth, then we can begin to learn on how we can improve. Uh, a step from there, once you've done that, run some practice scenarios. They're in the station and just practice talking to each other. One way you can do this is get a two, two handheld radios or use one in the truck and go to two separate parts of the station where you can't hear each other talking and begin relaying information back and forth. This is a great way to practice and a great way to learn how people communicate and how, they, how to uh, make sure information is being shared properly. Because the only way you're going to be able to make sure the information gets relayed by doing this, doing this type of a, uh, practice session, is through what you're communicating on the radio. Uh, another way you can do this as well is uh, record yourself. Maybe come up with a set of scenarios for yourself to work with and record them and listen back to how it sounds. Uh, well, if you do that, one thing I'd recommend is not necessarily to listen to it immediately because it's still fresh in your mind what you're trying to communicate. So, of course, it's going to make sense to you. Uh, record yourself, leave it for a little bit, come back, 
and listen and see if it still makes sense. And if it doesn't, then you know you, you've got to improve some of those uh, speaking skills. And then finally, the, the biggest one of all is practice, practice, practice. Again, going back to this is a tool. This is something we use just like any other tool we use on the uh, scene. And so you wouldn't want to put an air pack on one time and say, okay, I'm done, I'm trained, I can do it from here on out forever. Uh, same thing with tying knots. Tying knots. I, I tied it one time, I must have that skill down so I can do it all the time now. We all know that it, with any of those that it takes practice and not only just one time but ongoing practice to keep the skills up. The same thing happens with communication. Anytime we don't keep those skills up, we don't continue to improve the way we speak and the, improve the way we communicate on the fire ground, we, could, uh, we tend to lose them. And just like tying a knots, if you don't practice knots for a year, you're not gonna, you find that your skill level drops considerably. And so the more we practice, the more we keep doing this over and over again, and the more we keep working on those communication skills, we'll see things improve. And uh, definitely this is a great way to ensure that what we're communicating around and what we're talking, back, talking about on the scene is understood and can be responded to. What we want to talk about now is effectively ensuring that information is disseminated. Now we're going, to, we're going to step out a little bit broader rather than just in the fire scene because this is applicable to many areas of the fire service. But I, I will stay focused in that particular area. The first point I want to bring up when I talk about how to effectively disseminate information is stick to the basics. Now, and this is sometimes, this is a mistake a lot of people make is they try to get so detailed, they try to draw in so much information into their statement, into their broadcast, whatever the case may be, that it gets lost. The actual message, the intent gets lost. So this is why I say, let's step back, let's look at the basics, and we answer the questions of the who, what, how, when, and why. Those are the things, if we focus on when we're doing our communication, and what we're sending out, we'll find that you'll find that things become a lot simpler, that they become more understandable to the other party, and it's a lot easier to break down into sentence fragments what we're talking about. Well, maybe let's take a look at this from the standpoint of an example. If I were, if I have a team inside the building, a crew in there doing fire ground operate, or doing operations, and I need to relay a message to them, I want them to move to the other side of the building and begin operations there. All right, the first thing I want to do, and, and actually a, a neat little way to do this is to maybe just create a little, you, know, you can print it out of your, off your computer to keep in your vehicle, keep on the truck, where the case, but basically like a little cheat sheet so you know what to, to send out. The, the first thing is who. Who do I want to send this message to? In this case, our, based on our example, we're wanting to send it to the team, the team inside the building. All right, the second question, what do I want them to do? I want them to move to the other side of the building, in which case we may just say it's the C side of the building, to stay consistent. So we've got the who answered, the what answered, how. In this case, we may need to tell them how. We need them to exit the building, go around to the C side, and enter, the, enter from the exterior. And so we've got the, that, that information may be relevant and may be necessary, so we want to make sure that question is answered. Uh, when? Based on our example earlier, we saw our, our comments earlier, we said when is one of the questions. And in this case, we may say immediately. There may be circumstances where you don't need them to move to the other side of the building until later. But we need to know that when and when it's going to take and how we want it, when, when it's going to take place. And then finally, why? Do we want them, there has to be a reason we, that I want them to move over there. Uh, maybe it's to do search and rescue. So our why question is so they can begin search and rescue on the room adjacent to the C side of the building. So we, by answering those basic five questions, we, be, we have our message that we, we need to relay, and it's very simple, very easy for them to understand, and it becomes a, a, a situation where we don't have to worry about trying to explain ourselves. So we say, uh, interior team, I need you to move to the C side of the building, uh, by exiting the front and going and entering through the exterior uh, immediately so you can begin search and rescue in the room on the seaside of the building. To understand this even further, let's take a situation where it may happen incorrectly. And so, for example, we didn't, didn't address one of those questions. 
And so let's say we, we don't address the how. So for example, we have uh, the who is the interior team. We need you to um, go to the C side of the building immediately to do search and rescue. We didn't tell them how. Now, that in, in some cases, that may work fine. There may not be an issue. They may be able to go whichever, by whatever means uh, are necessary. But let's say there's a collapsed floor on their path to the C side of the building from the interior. Now, if we, we may know that. It may have been broadcast over the radio, but the interior team may not have heard that. Again, we have, we have a lot of chatter going on, and they're wearing a lot of gear, so the likelihood of them hearing that may, may not be as well as we think. So by not, us not relaying that piece of the information, we could potentially put them in harm's way or put them in a situation where they get in trouble because of a little snippet we left out. And so we want to make sure that we keep all our bases covered. And again, taking a clipboard and maybe some, a paper, it just make sure you've got all the information you need to relay to them. And it makes it a lot simpler, and then you, at that point you're just referencing your sheet. The next point we want to talk about is how to deliver that message as well. Keep your message brief and concise. Now that may sound contradictory to the previous point of making sure you cover all your information, but the two actually can work together. Uh, and just because you have a lot of information to relay doesn't mean you have to relay it all at one time. So it's, very, it's much easier to break it down into clear, simple, concise points. And that's exactly the way to think of it. It is uh, just very clear, simple, concise points. Keep your statements short, as short as possible. Don't, don't intentionally abbreviate them down, but make sure that you're not relaying any more information than's necessary. And this is for a number of reasons. One, as I said earlier, it mentally and the way we absorb information, long statements, extended out statements and things like that are very hard to understand and very hard to remember. Particularly when you're dealing in a crisis situation and hearing is a, a bit of a problem. Uh, the other part is, is there are also a number of other crews, teams, individuals that will also be talking more than likely on the same channel you're using. And in those situations, if you're spending a lot of time talking, they're not able to relay information. And so it, it can create bottlenecks for other parts of the operation. So keep them simple, make sure there's something that can be understood, and keep, them sh keep your message short. And then you'll also find it'll be easier for them to confirm back that they heard what you said. Let's take an example here of looking at the same transmission delivered two different ways and look at how keeping it clear and concise is much easier than trying to give as much information as possible on the radio. The first one I'll take is, uh, I'll show you is when we give too much information. So I'm the incident commander, I'm transmitting to the team there in the building and my comment uh, comes back to the incident command to interior team leader interior team leader responds with go ahead. So I then respond back with I need you to take your uh, exit the building, take the hose line, also Jim and Bob need to come with you, yourself, make sure any tools you've got need to c come out as well and you can kind of see as, we're, as I'm talking eventually mentally he's just going to shut off and all he's going to hear is we need to get out of the building, we need to exit the building. And that, that comes from the fact that we only take things in small snippets. We don't take big, long sentences a, a, into memory very well. A second approach would be, would be to say, um, come back to say instant command to interior team leader. He responds, go ahead. I said, I need your team and all of your equipment to, to exit the building. Very much simpler, much shorter, and much more concise. It accomplishes the same message, it says the same thing, and, but it's a lot shorter and a lot easier to remember. As you can see from this, the, the definite lesson learned here is that it, it needs to be tr trained on and it needs to be learned in ongoing practice because we need to make sure that these are skills we keep up and that we don't lose, otherwise it can create problems for us as we get onto the fire scene. Now an issue we want to take a moment and talk about is an issue called cognitive dissonance. And this is a very common occurrence on the fire ground. Now, if you consider for a moment all that goes on on the fire scene, you consider we've got crews working in the building, they may be pulling ceilings, pulling walls, 
You've got teams in there knocking down fire. You've got other teams that are going also doing uh, search and rescue. You may have people also trying to pull furniture and belongings out of the house so that they don't get further damage. There's a number of things happening here and a lot of things going on. As well, you've got bells going off. You may have uh, air packs, the sounds from the air pack that are being picked up. So you can imagine when someone tries to communicate to you inside the building, that when you're inside the building, it can be very hard to hear and it can be very hard to understand. And one of the things that tends to happen is when we're inside the building working and all of this noise is going on, the tendency is to begin to kind of mentally block it out so that we can focus on what we're doing. Now that works great to continue that focus and to keep us focused on what we're doing. The problem is if somebody tries to communicate to us over the radio, there's a good chance that we won't hear it. And this is a common problem. Unless there's something to snap the person out of what they're focused on and to listen to the radio communication, uh, you may find yourself where they're trying to broadcast and nothing's heard. So one of the things that I highly recommend if it's not a part of your department uh, policy is to find ways using the radio to kind of break that, that thought process or to break that concentration so that when you've got an important message that you've got to relay to everyone inside the building or to a particular crew inside the building. And so look, think of keywords or think of things that you can use that will help break, uh, bring that focus back to what you're trying to say. Now a good thing about this is that it actually doesn't take something incredibly traumatizing or uh, problematic to get someone's attention and to break that concentration. It can be something very simple as a tone. It can be something, the air horn on the, on the apparatus. Things like that can be used and that's one of the reasons you typically see when people are teaching about how, when to make a call to evacuate the building, the common practice is to sound the air horns to let everybody know to get out of the building. The reason for that is because of this situation. You may be concentrating, working on something, uh, very focused on it, and if somebody sends something over the radio, very likely you will not hear it. So by doing the air horns, it's a break in the monotony, it's a break in the ongoing noise, and that'll cause you to suddenly get focus your attention on what's being said. And this is a good thing to do and, and to find ways that you can do this using the radio. Maybe there's some type of noise on the radio or simply calling their name initially. And this is actually a, one of the reasons you typically have uh, the, the, when you broadcast your message that you say who you are and then who you're trying to contact because that immediately keys up for the, pers to the person who's receiving the message. Oh, wait a minute, they mentioned my name or they mentioned my title. I need to focus on what's being said. And then again, waiting for that confirmation back that they hear you and want you to proceed with your message. Now, the next point I want to talk about is that you should always receive confirmation that your message was correctly received. And I, I know we've talked about this in the previous parts, but it's what do you do when you don't get that? And this is very important because you always, always, I can't emphasize this enough, want confirmation that what you're telling the other person is received and received properly and, and well understood. Some things you can do for that, if for example, I send a message to the interior team, uh, interior attack team, I need you to move to the C side of the building, using our, working off of our same example. I don't get confirmation. So I, at that point, I don't know if they've received it, I don't know if they've understood it, or, or if they've even heard it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come back onto the radio again and I'm going to say, interior attack, did you, understand, did you receive my last message? And if I, at that point, if they just say yes, there again, we hit, we hit that closed in a question, which means we can't, we really don't have confirmation. Then I'll, then I'll come back with, can you please confirm? Or can you con please confirm? And then that's telling them to repeat back to me what I said. And that way I know that what I told them was understood and that they can now move from there. So we, we want to get it in that type of order. And again, if we don't get the confirmation, you need to go ahead, if you don't get the confirmation you're looking for, you need to go ahead and force it. Force the issue in the sense of tet, calling them back, asking them to confirm. Now, and then again, if you don't get um, response back the second and third time, then you're going to want to send in another team to find out what's going on and to follow up with them to see what the issue is. Now one thing that does come up is what do you do if you've got a crew that is 
consistently not responding back to you or you've got an individual that's not responding back to you. Uh, how do you handle that? And my, my comment to that specifically is that it needs to be addressed because it does create a breakdown in the communication system when you're not getting individuals or crews that are responding back to you. Uh, the initially, I would suggest handling it immediately. Let them know, and this is your feedback to them, let them know that they need to respond back to your radio transmissions. They need to respond back to others. It may be a situation they may, maybe they don't know. For whatever reason, they didn't understand they were supposed to do that. And this gives you the opportunity to go ahead and correct that before they go back in the next time and potentially you could have a problem then. So giving that immediate feedback or response that if they, to let them know that they need to be responding back to you is, very, uh, is a good point to bring home. Next point I want to talk about is avoid slang or technical jargon. And it may sound, this may sound silly to have to do. We're, we're all firefighters, we're all operating on the same scene and more than likely most of us will be from the same department. But the, the issue that comes up when you use, let's take for example slang or contractions or things like that on the radio, a lot of times they can be misunderstood or not heard properly when, by the time it's received by the other person. So try to avoid make, using contractions, using slang. Make sure you go ahead and sound the words out. Be very precise in your sound and that way you have a better chance of as it's being transmitted it's being heard like it's supposed to. The other one is technical jargon and uh, the reason I say that is that even though most of the people on your scene may be from your department and you guys use the same terminology there may be others on there as well uh, from other departments that may not use that same terminology and so you want to make sure that the terms you use, the way you phrase things um, are, are very understandable to whoever's listening. And uh, one of the early examples of this were the old tin codes that we used to use uh, in the fire service and they were the same ones with law enforcement. And oftentimes when I'd visit towns and th things like that you would see that the fire department and the police department may have different tin codes. So even within a municipality they couldn't communicate to each other because their the differentiation in the way they were talked. Add in now another department or several departments that may have their own TIN code system and you just really increase the problem. So the, the, key, the key lesson here is to stay with, stay with common terminology, common language, stay away from contractions and, and slang terms and keep it very simple. Now the last point I want to bring up on this particular topic is the issue of remember the listener may use other terminology than you use. So you want to make sure that you're talking in the same language, using the same terminology that they are. And I'll give you a perfect example. In the East Coast, we have engines and we have tankers. Engine is the apparatus that goes to the scene, they pull the hose, they fight the fire using the engine, uh, in most cases. Uh, as well, the tanker is what provides a water supply if we're dealing in a rural environment. So we want the, those are two. Now out West, you, you typically hear less of the use of the term engine and more use of pumper. And the pumper is the apparatus that goes to the scene and pull hose and fights the fire. From the uh, standpoint as well, you also tend to hear water tender instead of tanker. If I were out west and I called for a tanker, I'm going to get an airplane coming with a lot of water that they've got to dump before they can land again. So we want to make sure in those situations, and as we're dealing with different agencies and different departments, that we're all operating on the same terminology and that we all have a consistent way of understanding each other. Now to conclude with this segment, I want to emphasize a very important point here, and that is communication, as we've talked about throughout this segment, is very, very important and very critical to the instant success. As I've said before, anytime you see a breakdown or something that occurs that goes wrong on the fire scene, typically ties back to some problem in the communication process. So it's everyone's responsibility in the department to ensure that they understand and properly are able to communicate with other people. Uh, from the firefighter level, it's ensuring that you understand what's required of you when you're speaking on the radio. It's understanding that you can speak appropriately, that you speak with the c consistency that we talked about here. From the officer up and other levels of management within the fire department, it's important to understand that 
all of your firefighters are going to look to you to look for that standardization. So your role in this is not only to work on the speaking skills, but to establish the standardization within your department. How do you, what do you expect from people when they respond to a call? What do you expect when they arrive to get when they arrive on scene? What type of communications do you anticipate throughout the incident? And how do you expect people to talk to each other over the radio? All of these issues are fall in the area of etiquette on the radio. And it's up to you as the chief officer and the management level people to ensure that that's established and enforced so that you have that consistency.